<clears throat> I see we can start. Oh, yay, oh, yay, oh, yay. All persons have business before the Honorable, the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit are admonished to draw near and give their attention for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. Case number 20-7110, In re, Larry Elliott Clayman. Mr. Clayman for the respondent. Mr. Larry Clayman. Good morning, please proceed. For myself, thank you, and may it please the court, Judge Henderson, Judge Tatel, congratulations on your senior status, and also Judge Edwards. I want to pose this question to the court. May it please the court. I left Judicial Watch back in 2003. I left it in the hands of a non-lawyer, and there were three particular clients and individuals that were seriously affected when I left. One of them was Louise Benson, who was like my surrogate mom. And she had donated $15,000 and pledged 50 to buy an office at Judicial Watch. Judicial Watch misappropriated that money. There was another client, Peter Paul, who we had agreed that we would try to help, came forward with information as a whistleblower. Judicial Watch abandoned that client as well. And then, of course, there was Sandy Cobus, office manager in Miami, and she was harassed. All of these three individuals had lawyers, but they could not afford to continue on. As the head of a public interest group, I felt I had an ethical duty, notwithstanding all the legal and factual arguments that we've made in the brief, and I'm sure you've read them, so I don't need to belabor that unless you want me to. But Professor Ronald Rotunda, a renowned ethics expert, took a look at the situation. He issued an opinion. It was admitted into the record of this case before the DC Disciplinary Council, and then of course, the Board of Professional Responsibility. And he said that I did not commit an ethics violation. This case is now 13 years old. There's probably not another bar in the country that would have a case that would last so long. Most of them have either precedent on latches, Texas statute of limitations. It's a very, very old case. I have also served the 90 days. In fact, I withdrew from this court uh, in, out of respect for that at the time uh, when I also withdrew from other courts. So it's over. And Mr. Clayman, Mr. Clayman, let me, <clears throat> let me ask you a couple of questions. Sure. Um, sure. You, you don't, you don't deny that. Um, okay. Let's start with the Benson case. You don't deny, right, that while at Judicial Watch, you solicited that contribution and worked with her on it, right? I, sol I solicited. You, you, yes, no, I don't okay. deny that. I solicited okay. it as and, a and lawyer. And also, and that yeah. you, and that you, I just want to get make sure I understand the facts. Sure. And that with without any consent from Judicial Watch, right, you represented uh, Benson in litigation to recover that same money, right? That's correct. Okay. At some point, um, I did. And I also, said. also, and also with res with respect to the uh, Paul case. Uh, while at Judicial Watch, you, uh, you represented Judicial Watch in negotiations with him. And then again, without consent from Judicial Watch, you entered appearances in a case against Judicial Watch regarding that same one, right? That's correct. So, okay. So, so as Judge Lambert says, these are, uh, this is just a classic violation of the, uh, of DC uh, ethics rule, uh, 1.9. I mean, 1.9 is crystal clear. It says that a lawyer who has formally represented a client in a matter, that's you, shall not, shall not represent. There's, there's no exception to this at all. There's no exception for, uh, for the client being unable to find a lawyer. There's no exception for public interest lawyers. Uh, I don't, I guess, like Judge Lambert, I, I guess I don't see any way in which you've satisfied your burden under our rule to show that this uh, decision by the TC Court of Appeals is somehow not supported by evidence. 
You, know, you, raised, a good, you raised a good question, yeah. which I wanted to raise. Is that number one, Judge Lambert said there was some ambiguity. He understood why I stepped in to help these people. Number he said, two, excuse me, Mr. Clinton, he said there was some ambiguity with respect to the question of what would happen to the client if you withdrew. There was no ambiguity in his mind about your violation of the DC rule. Let me get to the major point, if I may. Well, let's just, no, let, let's, let's just finish this. He said, do you see my point about that? He said, let me find what he said. I'm not, dis I'm not disputing what he wrote. He wrote what he wrote, Your Honor. No, what but I'm do, you, do, you understand, do you understand my point? That this is a, he was troubled by the fact that allowing you to withdraw would leave someone unrepresented. But he wasn't at all ambiguous about your violation of the D.C. rule, right? You agree with that, right? He was not yeah. ambiguous about that, but let me also raise this. Mm -hmm. He also showed up without a subpoena to testify on my behalf. At the Who showed up? Who showed up? Lambert. Judge Lambert testified on my behalf. You can go back he into the record and see that. He, he showed up he, what? He came voluntarily but, to but testify the, the on question, my behalf. Mr. And here's what he Mr. said. Mr. Clayton, the question before us is whether you have satisfied your burden under our rule to show that this sanction is not supported by substantial evidence. Um, if I may respond. Sure, to please. Go ahead. Judge Lambert testified at the disciplinary hearing that he did not refer the matter to bar counsel because he didn't think it rose to that level. He's actually referred many lawyers to that level. He did not sanction me. And when I was disqualified and I'd actually had advice of counsel, that's in the opinion of the DC Court of Appeals, that I was not in fact committing an ethical violation. I ceased representing the other two clients as well immediately. So I did my obligation. I respected Judge Lambert's order and I moved on, but I posed here's, that question. Here's, here's what Judge Lambert said in his written order. Quote, the court can simply not condone such a flagrant violation of professional responsibility essential to the proper functioning of our system of justice. That's what Judge Lambert said. And he did not sanction me because he, understand, he understood there were the only, question, the only question before Judge Lambert at that point was whether to permit you to withdraw. That was well, here's thing. the question before you, Your Honor. Yeah, okay. go ahead. The question mm -hmm. before you is, these individuals were unrepresented. They were being harmed by Judicial Watch was being run by non-lawyer Tom Fitton at the time. I felt as someone who started an ethics organization, Judicial Watch, I had a duty as a matter of last resort to try to help them pro bono. But more importantly than that, I hope that you will read the opinion of Ronald Rotunda, which is attached to the I, we've, we've, we've all read that opinion. Uh, in fact, I knew Ron Rotunda. So yeah, he was a great man. I knew him when he was a young lawyer at Wilmer. We worked together yes. on some civil rights matters. I knew Ron Rotunda. Yes. And, and I've, already, I've already served my time here, Your Honor. I'm, I, I was well, outside wait, of the court well, for 90 let's days. Talk about, let's, let's talk about that for a minute. You served your time because you voluntarily didn't handle cases in the DC in the federal courts for 90 days, right? Is that your I point? Actually filed, I actually filed pleadings withdrawing during that period of time from but the DC circuit. Am I right also, Mr. Clayman, that you didn't do that until after uh, we were notified by the DC Court of Appeals um, that you had been sanctioned? I right? had, I had a, a, I don't remember the timing specifically, but I do know this, I was challenging that, I was asking for that would okay, be reconsidered. You, okay, but you yes. know what rule, our, our disciplinary rule 10 requires lawyers to notify this court when they've been sanctioned by another court, right? I don't did understand you do that. that. I understand that now, Your Honor, yes. Did you do that? No, okay. Well, no, I and, did it ultimately. I did ultimately. Look, Your Honor, here's the thing. Did you do it, Mr. Clement? did you do it before we issued, before we were notified by the Court of Appeals? I don't know that you were notified. I don't recollect whether you were notified by the Court of Appeals. I know that what we have here you were notified by the you, Court of Appeals. Did you, did you do it? You were notified. I did it ultimately. Yes, I did, Your Honor. You, you did it in response to our order to show cause. I don't remember the specific timing. Yeah. Okay. In the so brief. let me ask you a let me just ask you a a fact question. Um, are you now representing anybody in the federal court, DC federal court, or in our court at this point? Um. Yes, uh, I have a case with Laurie Loon, who is in front of you right now. It's, it's ripe for a decision in front of the D.C. Circuit right now. And when was and there, that? There was an oral argument set 
for another client, two clients by the name of Lavellian and also uh, Stewart with regard to a matter involving the Bundy standoff. Okay, so that is in court, but I've taken no action in those cases. But, no. but the point is your counsel of record in just your counsel of record in which cases? No, just repeat them for me, please. Uh, uh, Laura, Laura Loon versus Fox News and Suzanne Scott. Okay. And that's in and our court. Lavellian and Stewart uh, mm -hmm. versus FBI, mm -hmm. I believe it is. I don't remember who the lead defendant is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if your honor suspends me for, for 90 days, I will obviously withdraw from those cases. So I respect that. But if I may add one other thing. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I had please. asked, D.C. Bar Council has, like everything else, unfortunately, in a city that we all love, has become very, very partisan. We know what's happening. 13 years. Well, Eight years to even start Mr. the case. Kleinman, wait, Mr. Kleinman, I mean, that's a pretty serious accusation. Do you... Uh, I mean, Honor, you can read the newspaper that, and see it. Well... <laughs> okay. For, for Clayton, all, all the, all the I, former I bar think, presidents, let me finish. All the former bar presidents of D.C. Bar filed a complaint against Attorney General Bill Barr for withdrawing the indictment against uh, General uh, Flynn and, and remarks he made on Fox News. Kellyanne Conway got a bar complaint. As far as I know, it's still going on for what she said on MSN, NBC, so what, what Senators is, Cruz. What does that got to do? What, what I'm saying is this case I mean, was really resurrected. This, this case was resurrected. This All right, let me let me stop yeah. this. Mm -hmm. I've heard enough. Judge Edwards, do you have any questions? No, I have no questions. All right. Judge Tatel, unless you have something you want to follow up on. Yeah, hold on just one second. Um, um, Point I'm making. Can I, can I say one thing, Judge Henry? No, you cannot. Um, 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 No, okay. Judge Henderson, I'm through. I'm finished. Thank you. Can I, right. can I say one last thing, Your Honor? All right. Yeah. The case wasn't started for eight years. Any other jurisdiction in this country would not have started a case eight years into it, and now it's 13 years, just on the basis of latches alone. And the fact that I do respect this court, and I do respect the bar. I started Judicial Watch because I believe in ethics in government. I respectful request that I not be given an additional 90 days, much like the Ninth Circuit decided not to do, uh, because they also entertained a order to show cause such as the one in front of this court. But the case is now 13 years old. And I hope, Your Honor, that you will write something to give advice to the District of Columbia Bar disciplinary apparatus. The cases, you know, should not linger for 13 years and be resurrected after eight years. And that's what I meant. And everybody knows who I am. Everybody knows I'm a strong advocate. Everybody knows, you know, I've taken strong positions. Okay. I much like Attorney there, General Mr. Clayton, let me, let me just ask you one question. I know we need to move on here, but uh, you, you did argue latches. You argued due process, but I didn't see any, any evidence at all, uh, any, any citations to anything which to suggest that uh, whatever the delay was, it in any way prejudiced you. Um, it was, Your Honor. You, you said you couldn't introduce uh, documents. You said you couldn't introduce witnesses, but you agreed with me at the beginning of your argument this morning that you, are, you represented three clients in litigation against Judicial Watch on matters uh, that you had consulted, with, that you had advised Judicial Watch on without their consent. There doesn't need to be any more evidence. That's it. Well, you're what entitled else to... There need? Your Honor, I, I, uh, I, respectfully, I respectfully disagree. There's a matter of equity here, too. And there's always a matter of equity. And, and judges have to consider that as right. well. Uh, okay. I, have, I have no further questions. All right. We have your argument, Mr. Clayman. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you call the next case? Case number 20-1090 et al. RAV Truck and Trailer Repairs, Inc. and Concrete Express of New York, LLC, Petitioners versus National Labor Relations Board. Mr. Tulancic for the petitioner, Mr. Sauter for the respondent. Mr. Tulancic, 
Mr. Lincic, good morning, and you may proceed. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. The board's remedial order in this case should not be enforced because compliance with the order would cause my client substantial economic harm. My client closed his business because he lost his lease and because he was operating at a substantial loss. He had lost $270,000 in 2017. He was losing some $44,000, I believe, up through May of 2018. My client operated a registered motor vehicle repair shop in New York. What that means is he can perform repairs on third party um, vehicles for compensation. The building itself is what is registered, not the business. So when my client lost his lease, he also lost his registration. He moved to a different location for a period of three months. The lease specifically stated it was to finish the repairs from the old location. The lease terminated at the end of May, 2018, and he, sh and he shut down the business. According to board case law, even if the closing is found to be discriminatory, the restoration order should not be enforced because as written, it requires my client to violate New York law. And it also causes my client to restore an unprofitable business, which board case law clearly states they will not and cannot do. So in this matter, the board is arbitrarily applying case law to force my company to reopen. Also, my company under Darlington- Did you put, any, did you put in any decent evidence before the board on the, your client's economic situation? Can you yes. hear me okay? I'm not, I, can you hear me okay? Yes, your honor. Okay. We did, we filed a, we-, we you just put in a tax return belatedly. There was we put in a not signed. The, the tax return that we that we submitted at trial was not signed. Right. That that tax return was filed in September electronically. That is why it was not signed. The judge asked for a signed copy. My client signed it. We submitted it five months before he issued his decision, but it was filed in September. Did you, did you try this before the board? I did, your honor. I, when you reflect back on it, if you're trying to prove economic incapacity, is that really the way you'd make your case? I, I'm not getting it. it I, I mean, there's no brain surgery required here. If you're trying to show I lost the lease uh, and here, on my financials, you stick in a tax return and that's it. That's, that's, Your a sum total. I, I, I mean, I, I'll be, I, I, I'm sorry if it sounds a little bit callous, but I don't get it. I, I understand what you're saying. I presented the evidence. What evidence? <laughs> that was given to me. Oh, the, okay. The evidence. So you are, right, so wait, so I, I need to understand this because I'm being totally honest with you. We're all smart people sitting on this screen. Uh, that isn't the way you'd prove economic incapacity. It's really not a hard thing to do to show that I have a client. Our claim is that in this business that we're fighting over, there were continuous losses and there's no prospect of it getting better. And we've lost the lease, et cetera, et cetera. It's an easy way to prove those things. Now, are you telling us now that you simply because of the situation you were in, you couldn't get more than you put in? Because what you put in was silly. Your Honor, that's your opinion. I, I, I disagree. No, no, counsel, you just said there's, there, there are better ways to do it, to show economic incapacity. First an, uh, first, an unsigned tax return. And the return doesn't tell you anything other than it's a, it's a snapshot, but it do doesn't tell you what's going on with a business. And, and that's all you put in was an economic return. I mean, a tax return that showed my client lost $272,000, yes. But that doesn't tell you about ongoing capacity. All right, I, I, you're answering my question. That's all you put in. Uh, I, I thought you were indicating to us that that's all you were given. 
And so that's why that's all you put in. Correct. Okay. That, that's correct, Your Honor. That gives, that gives me some explanation because I still want you to know as a lawyer like you, if that's the best you can do improving economic incapacity, you really ought to rethink it. That's not the way you do it. I'm sorry you think that, Your Honor. I mean, and, and, I'm, and it's an important point as it turns out under the case law. That's why I'm all over you on this. Because it is, it's a very important point, you made Your Honor. Our, you made I, our work, you're making our work a whole lot harder. I, I don't disagree with that, but the case law is clear. He lost his lease. He didn't case close law is, because of the union. Excuse me? Excuse me? No, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I, 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 I didn't hear. I, I didn't know if you were speaking a question. I'm sorry. No, the case law. I, I didn't know what you you said. The case law is clear. And then you said he lost his lease. That has yeah, the case. I mean, I, there is a case that I cited. That is the same exact issue where did you put the did you put the lease in yes the okay. both leases are in okay both leases are in he lost his lease so therefore he lost his his operation of being a quote unquote registered repair shop right um he simply leased 600 square feet in another location that wasn't registered to finish the repairs and then he was done he shut the business down in chariot marine fabricators Industry Corp, 335, NLRB 339, 2001. There was no restoration order where a single employer closed its unprofitable operation, but continued its profitable operation, even though the closing violated Section 8A3 of the Act. The board said the restoration would be unduly burdensome because the employer lost its lease, would be forced to lease a new premise, and would require reopening two years after closure and would therefore threaten the viability of the profitable operation. Mm -hmm. he, he cannot, there's, there's three options on the table for him under this, under the board's order right now. He can violate New York law and be fined $1,000 each time he gets caught. He that, can, that, that's all in the record. That's in the record. Mm -hmm. He can find a new location to either lease or buy and have it retrofitted to become a registered motor vehicle repair shop, all which requires automatic sprinklers, fire alarms, standpipes, oil and water separation, mechanical ventilation, or he can try to find a new lease of a building that's already registered. Was the case that you just cited, uh, uh, Charlotte uh, Chariot Marine? Yes. Yeah, and that's where the uh, company's controller testified to the company's monthly financials, right? I believe so. Yeah, is that what happened here? It is not, Your Honor. Yeah, right, that's what I'm asking. That's my concern. You're making it so much harder for us than it otherwise needs to be. How long did they continue finishing up, as you put it? Uh, he signed the lease in April. He No. Yes, he signed the lease in April. Wasn't allowed to begin repairs until mid to late April. Um, he closed the business. Um, he was done with repairs mid-May, closed the business in mid-May. So he operated for a month. And, and there's evidence in the record to indicate that that second lease no longer exists? Correct. That lease had an expiration date. 531-2018. All right. And what's the what's the evidence indicating that he no longer does repair work? What's the other business doing? That's the truck? He is he it's a concrete, it's a concrete business. So cement trucks, they mix on site, they deliver concrete. All right. And that's still operating. That is still operating. They are operating at current time two to three trucks. And how many employees there? Um I believe it is two drivers, um, a dual employee, yard man, mechanic, and the owner. Right. And what do I do as a judge with the undisputed evidence that in this case, everyone agrees that this is one operation? Correct. Just like it was in Chariot Marine Fabricators. Well, Chariot Marine Fabricators has some evidence in it, but in any event, I'm still, what does that mean? 
It's one it operation. Means, if, if he's if he's one operation, one operation was a motor vehicle repair shop. They operated, they performed repairs on third party trucks. Right. We've admitted, we've admitted that they also performed some repairs on his concrete trucks. The right. two mechanics that operated at Rob, one said he spent two to three days a week on the trucks. The other said he spent two to three hours a day on the so, truck. So the record indicates that it's one operation, undisputed, and there's crossover work. There is there is some crossover work, but the 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 other case there is a there is another case out there, and the judge did find that Concrete Express does have a mechanic that that performs work only on the Concrete Express trucks. Which means what? If this also, if, if wait a minute, I'm trying to get you to understand what I'm understanding about the record. The record is it's only one operation, no, one well, owner, one op. That's conceded. It's one operation. Correct. Two separate and, businesses, one operation. And well, there are lots of business that businesses that do more than one thing. So that's not really interesting. There are lots of businesses that exist that way. And you've kind of constructed a picture here, a legal picture of one operation that does a couple of things. And apparently there's crossover work. If I'm working in one side, I can also work in the other side. Yes? No, no, no. no. That is not that is not what happens. Never happens? No. There, there, I thought you just told me it does locations. happen. I thought you told me. No, no. That I, I understand what you're saying. There are two separate locations. Right. I understand. Concrete trucks, which at Concrete Express, and they have their own mechanic. Yeah. There was rob truck and trailer repair that had their own mechanics that worked on third party trucks that was their business model did rob ever work on the cement side they, they worked on some of the cement trucks yes All right so that in this record in a single operation the record indicates that it not only was possible it had been done that people in rob could work on the cement side that was nothing unusual about that the frequency is not the question I'm raising. It was done. Yeah, you're correct. Yes. Okay. So, and I, I, I'm trying to give this some context because you're fighting about the restoration order and I understand that, but you see, when you think about it uh, and it's one employer and one operation for this legal record, uh, a remedy could be constructed where to the extent that there was work available, the employees in Rav who allegedly have no more work to do in the RAV operation could do it in the cement operation. That would remain to be seen in compliance. They can work. Yes. There's two trucks where now three mechanics right. would be working on two trucks and they would no longer be receiving a profit from, from working on those trucks. That's so all the rather wait, than wait, shut wait, down wait, one wait, business. Wait, you're fighting about, two you, businesses. you're not listening to my question. You're fighting about something I'm not raising. The economic inability is one issue. I'm respectful of that. I'm not fighting that. Uh, that remains to be seen in part because you didn't prove it very well. Uh, the question I'm raising is the possibility of Rav, people who mostly worked in Rav, being able to work in cement in what is a single operation. And you're conceding, yes, that possibility exists. You're saying, but there may be a problem because they may not make any money if they do it that way. No, the problem is there is little to no work to do. You're, you're asking I wanna, the mechanics to you're work. You're trying to make the argument about economic incapacity. Okay? Leave it aside. I'm not doubting the importance of that. I want to make sure I have this structure straight in my head. You're not doubting there's a single operation in which employees on either side can work on the other side. The yes or no? They could, no. go, they could go to Concrete Express and sit there and not do anything. No, no, no. You're being sarcastic. And I'm, I'm not, to... Your Honor, I'm now, not. The counsel, well, then let's, let's do it this way. Let's assume some men has more work than they know what to do with. Okay. Is it very, is it very likely that people in Rob could be put over there? If they have more work than they know what to do yes, with, take yes, my they hypothetical. Do not. Please don't, don't quibble with it. They have more work than they know what to do with. Stay with my question, please. Yes. It's really frustrating. Stay with my question. Yes. I'm trying to understand this case. They have more than they know what to do with in the structure that you have, I thought, conceded exists as I'm describing it. There's one operation. And so if the work goes down in Rav, in this one operation, people in Rav can go over to the cement side 
and do the work there. And that would not be a surprise if the work was there, right? Yes or no? Well, no, because Concrete Express has its own mechanic. Council, Concrete Express has its own mechanic. If there's more work, then Concrete Express knows what to do with. More if there's work more work, than they know what seen. to do with. And the Rav people are now out of work. Would it be a surprise to anyone that this owner would say, well, I want some of the Rav people to go over the cement and work there? Right? If there's more work than they know what to do with it. Yes, I've said that 12 times now. Your Honor, I, I no, understand. You're really, it's that. really annoying what you're doing. Stop playing with me. Answer my question. If there is That's more work than they I'm know I'm going to say one more time because it's really important. I've really tried to understand that case, and I'm not unsympathetic to the claim you're making, but you're making this really hard. I'm trying to figure out what the, uh, the corporate structure is here. There is an operation on one side and an operation on the other side. You're telling me they're connected, you agree with that, and you're quibbling over whether or not they could afford to move people over. I'm giving you a hypothetical, and I'm entitled to do that as a judge. I'm giving you a hypothetical that the cement side now has tons of work. Would it be a surprise to you, or would I be wrong in saying, would not be a surprise at all that the Rav people would be moved over to the cement side and do that work? If there was work available, they could go over and do that work. Thank you. It's taken us 12 minutes to get there. That's all I wanted to know. Judge Tatel, do you have any questions? I just have one, one very quick question, which is that uh, you and Judge Edwards have been talking about the, the remedy. I just have one question about the underlying, uh, the underlying violation. Uh, and it's this. Um, and it's about Trittini's testimony. It was critical to a whole series of issues here, to Valencia's termination, to Gonzalez's layoff, to the partial closure, to RV's economic state. It's critical to all of those issues. The board discredited, the board and the ALJ discredited his testimony on all of those issues. And you don't challenge that here, correct? It, Your Honor, do you, do you know why I, don't, I didn't challenge that? Just to answer I, my question. You no, didn't I did not. The last right, time okay, so, I, so court, can I, let I, me I had my question. Let me finish my question. My question is that since that's unchallenged, since his testimony is discredited, uh, when I looked at your briefs and I read them carefully, I couldn't find, I found almost nothing that could be used to counter the board's evidence in support of all of this. Can I speak, Your Honor? Yes, now you can answer my question. Am I right about that? What evidence is there in the record that could that you would point to other than Trentini uh, that would sustain your burden on any of these issues? The fact that the mechanic's own testimony says that they spend limited amounts of time working on the concrete express trucks their own testimony from Valencia said, I spend two to three hours a day on concrete express trucks. That's 15 hours a week. That's when they were operating. I'm not talking trucks. about the remedy. I'm talking about the underlying violation. Right. I'm talking about the underlying violation that they were, they were terminated because of their union activities. That's what I'm talking about. And the evidence that you rely on is Trattini, but he was discredited. So I just, I don't see your case anymore. Your Which Honor, is exactly why I thought you stood up talking about the remedy. I said, oh, he's, he's on to something. You know, he's going to skip his weak case, that is right. the merits, and talk about the remedy. Am I right about that? Yes, Your Honor. And can I, can I tell you why I skipped sure. the credibility? The last time I was before this court, I had three pages of a brief yeah. where where a witness lied and admitted lying under oath. And I argued credibility and I was told that I was barking up the wrong tree. Well, this is a totally different case. We, we different have lots case. of cases. It can't we be a lots serious of cases argument. Where you can, I'm sorry, Harry, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. For no. that. I mean, no, we have fine. lots of cases. We have lots of lawyers for companies who, 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 not lots, but we do have lawyers who stand up here and actually make an effective argument about an NLRB credibility finding. In fact, our case law permits that. 
So it's, it's stunning to me that you would say, well, since you lost in one case, you didn't make the argument here. I, I just don't understand that. Your Honor, it wasn't that I lost. It was that I was told you're barking up the wrong tree. We don't overturn credibility. There's lots of trees in the forest. And I understand, uh, barking, that. Yeah, I right. understand that. Okay, but well, do you have anything more to say? All right, but can you do anything in, in terms of your client's case uh, to reassure me that, uh, that uh, other than Trentini, I'm now I'm talking about the underlying violation, the discharge of Gonzalez and Valencia. That, in fact, let me just put it to you this way. Other than Trentini, what's the single best piece of evidence you would point to that supports your argument that the board's finding that those were motivated by anti-union animus is not supported by substantial evidence? What would you point to? Give me one thing. That he lost his lease and that he was already going to close the business. That's got nothing to do with the underlying violation of terminating Gonzalez and Valencia. So, okay, um, I have no further questions, Judge Anderson. All yeah. right, thank you. Uh, we'll give you a couple minutes in reply. Yeah. Mr. Sauter. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please this honorable court, Greg Sauter for the National Labor Relations Board. Um, the board's finding of facts demonstrate that the company was virulently opposed to its employees joining the union. Just the week before the events of this case, they threatened to fire three separate employees at Concrete Express and close that business altogether if they voted for the union. Significantly, when those, um, when the, those events went to a hearing and the judge issued a decision finding those facts, the company did not challenge a single one of them. And that court has, that, that case has been enforced by the board. All right, can, let, let's move to, if I may, my colleagues will take you back. Uh, Let's assume that the record is as Judge Tatel and, and your opposing counsel seem to be suggesting. There isn't a lot here to support the company's challenges to the, un, the findings of the underlying violations. Let's assume that's all correct, okay? Mm -hmm. The difficulty on your side, and, the thing, and that's why I was trying to get answers from the other side so we could sort this case out. Difficulty for your side is you have a Gissel bargaining order uh, you know, and uh, take giving you the benefit of the doubt soon seems like it's a plausible response to what the board was facing. That is, you now have a duty to bargain with the unit given these circumstances and you have a restoration and you have some underlying questions about economic, uh, whether or not the employer, uh, has a feasible operation, um, uh, I honestly can't square the Gissel bargaining order with the restoration order in my mind. I don't get what the board is trying to do there. In your mind, do you think the board is suggesting that there is a duty to bargain with respect to the effects of the closing of the operation? The board's not doubting that the operation was closed, right? No. Okay, and the board's not doubting that there is case law that says employers can close operations as they see fit, right? Of course. Okay, so then am I right in assuming that the most the board ought to be able to compel here is bargaining over the effects of the closing? Uh, I, I respectfully disagree, Your Honor. In this case, the board found that um, the, the closing of RAV was a violation under Darlington intended, was an act intended to chill the union activities that were ongoing at Concrete Express. And in those partial closing cases, the board's standard remedy is to is restoration. So that is separate. Those from cases routinely say, so long as we have some assurance that there are, the employer is, is in a position economically. Of okay. Of course. Of course. Well, there's no finding there. And is that your claim is that, well, the burden's on them and they didn't make the showing? That's that's absolutely it. And not only is that, that Your the, Honor. Does the, does the record show that the lease had run out? No, Your Honor. Uh, as we've shown in our brief, the, the this was a month-to-month -month lease. And under yes. New York law, 
uh, a, um, a landlord cannot cancel a month to month lease without at least a 30 day notice. And there's no evidence of any 30 day notice in this case. In fact, I would point out your honor that as, as, as of the hearing in this case, Concrete Express had the lease on the entire space of 3771 and 3773 Merit. So we don't know how that lease transferred from RAV to Concrete Express, but I, I, I have reasons to doubt that this was ever an issue. But certainly there was never any, there's no proof that notice was ever given. Whereas when they lost their lease at Edison, Trentini testified that he had been given oral notice that the landlord was terminating that lease. All right. So let me, let me ask you this. Let's assume I'm trying to figure out what does this restoration order mean? Uh, let's assume that in the cases you're pointing to, I think pose different factual scenarios. Let's assume there's a restoration order and it's viable and the employer is told you have to open up again and you have to bargain. The employer's obligation, as I understand it in the law, is to say, can say uh, under the law to the union, I have to bargain with you. I'm bargaining. I want to let you know that I'm closing my business. I'm closing part of the business. And I'm happy to bargain over the effects. Isn't that, isn't that perfectly lawful? Let's assume all of what the board is, I don't know what the restoration mean. If they're in fact really closing down, you say the record doesn't really show it. There's certainly enough to suggest there's not much there. There wasn't much there to begin with in terms of employees. Let's assume- well, and, that, and that means there, I'm sorry, go, go ahead. I, and that means that there isn't much to rebuild either, Your Honor. This is not a, a, a business where they have to. No, no, no. But the law, but the law doesn't law doesn't work that way. Employers are to, aren't. At least I don't think it does. Employers aren't on obligation to stay in business they don't want to stay in just because it would be easy to stay in. That's no, but the law. No, that's not the law. But they also can't close a business out of sheer right, anti-unanimity. All right. I gave you my hypothetical, so you should have had enough time by now to think about what's your answer to it. The question I'm raising is, let's assume mm -hmm. this restoration thing means something along with Gissel. And the employer says, OK, come on and let's bargain. Let me tell you something. I'm closing the operation now. Why? Because I don't have any money. I'm not making any money here. And I don't want to do it anymore. And I will, I will, my lawyer told me I have to bargain over the effects of this. I'm happy to bargain over the effects and say the union says, we want to put them in cement. You say, if there's any work there, I'm happy to consider them. I can tell you right now, there's not much, anything else you want to know on effects, I'm done. Isn't that lawful? I don't think so, your honor, because well, what more the employer has to do. Well, if uh, I'm assuming that under your hypothetical, this court has enforced the board's order. And in that case, the board's order requires the employer to reopen Concrete Express before it can decide to close it down and no, negotiate no, about no, let's effect. Say he's well advised. Counsel says reopen it. It's not worth You don't want to spend more lawyers fees with this. Just tell them it's, it's reopened because the board told you to. Tell a union to come in. Let's bargain. They come in and say, we're reopened now. We're going to close. We have a right to close. We're going to close. However, my lawyer told me I have to bargain over the effects of the closing. I'm happy to bargain with you over it. What questions do you have? We're closing this place down. And I'm not saying it uh, by virtue of having previously announced it. We're closing it down beginning tomorrow because I don't want to be in the business anymore. And I'm not making any money. And so there, what questions you have? And the question is, well, what about cement? Yeah, we'll look and see if there's any work there. I'll certainly consider your people, but we're closed. Anything else you want to know on effects? That's all the employer has to do, right? The, your, 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 your honor may well be right. I don't know. Oh, wait, no, no, I, no, no, finish it no, out. Just like, don't. No, I, 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 I'm not trying to equivocate. I'm just saying, I don't know if there would be some kind of charge that the union could file at that point, or if there is, they could argue that the employer did not make, you know, a. No, um, no, no, a no. Good no faith I'm trying, just like I was trying to do with the other side. I mean, I had lots of hypotheticals on this. No, 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 no. I understand. I understand. In, in employer, that case, in that case, as I under. The council sat him down. Right, right. I told them, don't fool mm -hmm. around. You have to be pleasant. You have to be respectful. 
you have to say, I have a duty to bargain and I'm here to bargain. But you know what? That duty only involves effects of closing because I am closing. Yeah, I, I think I think in that case, your, your, your honor is correct. They don't have to do anything more than that. Right. However, I would point out, your honor, that they, they say that they were losing money. But we as you as you've mentioned, there's no there's no that's absolutely not substantiated by the record. I also, right, I'd also point out. You're going off track. Wait, no, no. I want to make sure I want to get you on this track to make sure you're not disagreeing with what I'm seeing in this case. It's a weird situation. Um, uh, it doesn't matter losing money or not in my scenario. No, in your scenario, Cause, it doesn't. Because they could come back in and say, a union can say, you you claiming you're losing money? No, I don't want to do this anymore. But your honor- I it, hate it, the business. But your honor, that that uh, your, your scenario would apply, I think, in any restoration case of the board. Yeah, may. And so I, 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 that doesn't I'm not make sure why- I'm not sure why this. That's why I'm trying to understand. What does this restoration thing mean? The the employer is forced to come back into business in this situation. Mm -hmm. Now make it the for your purposes the worst situation. You said, "No, I'm not losing any money. I I could make a ton of money, but you know what? I don't want to. Sure, I want to be in cement, and I'm happy to bargain with you over the effects. And then I'm done. And I'm going to do it. Honestly, I'm going to bargain any effects you raise with me. I'm going to discuss with you, but I'm going out of business. I understand your honor. And, and I think you're, you're, I, 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 I will assume that you are right on, on, on this, on, on the, that the, <clears throat> that the employer could do this. I don't, I don't have a quarrel with that, Okay. but I think, easy, that, I think that your quarrel I think that you're easier, okay, wait a minute, let me finish it. I'm sorry. It's an easier case, right? If the employer really is strapped economically, right? It's sure. That, it, it's an even easier case. Right. Except that we have not only did they not show good evidence regarding RAV, we have absolutely zero evidence regarding the company's overall finances, Concrete Express. It's possible Concrete Express is making money hand over fist and they could easily reopen RAV. We don't know. We have zero information about Concrete Express. When you say easily open RAV, you're talking about a different employer. That, I, I'm really trying to pin you down. Do you right. really mean to say that an employer can be told even though you don't wanna do it, you have to open RAV? Yeah. Or is the restoration order nothing more than, no, you can't close it the way you did it. The way you did it was unseemly. So you have to open it again and maybe we'll be lucky and maybe you'll change your mind. So you have to go through the pretense of opening it again, but the employer can still say, but I'm closing it now. I'm gonna bargain honestly with you over effect, but I'm done. Perhaps I missed the point of your question earlier, but th there is no question that the board cannot force an employer to stay in business right. ad eternum just because they uh, just because they close for unlawful purposes. No, I, 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 I'm sorry if you ever. What difference does what difference does it make that the record shows that cement is making money hand over foot in my scenario? In your in your scenario of if they just want to get out, yep. it makes it makes no difference. Right, exactly. They can they can still do that. Okay. But I, I would suggest, Your Honor, that your, your quarrel is with the board's restoration order, with the, with the idea of the restoration remedy. And this court and others have held that that's a perfectly legitimate remedy. No, and I think fact, I think you're going to probably find, and I I wouldn't swear to it, uh, but I suspect you'll find in those cases there probably was a business that was maintainable and someone willing to maintain it. That just begs the question I'm trying to raise. In this situation where the employer is saying, probably with some force, I'm not making anything. It, it's small, it's insignificant, and I'm done. Whereas in some of these other cases, that was not really what was going on. But in any event, it doesn't matter. Even in the cases you're pointing me to, they didn't address the question I'm raising. And I want to make sure I understand what's here because those cases could end the same way. Those employers could also say, okay, let's bargain effects and we're done. Sure. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And, but I would, I would also add your honor that this is, that's the reason we have a compliance proceeding at that compliance proceeding. The employer can show really, it has get, basically gets a second bite at the apple to show that financially it's an undue burden to reopen RAV. 
Yeah, but there's an easier way to do it. Don't go to compliance. That's more lawyers fees. Just say, come on, my lawyer told me, come on, let's bargain. Incidentally, here's our proposal. We're going out of business. Why? Because we don't want to be in business anymore. We don't need to go to compliance. We're not even going to argue about economics. We're done. If, if the company wants to go through the hoops of re resetting up RAV and then saying, no, we don't no, want no, to do no, it, no, no, sure. no, 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 resetting up. <laughs> well, that's part of the board's order, right? I'm, what, I'm reset, what does that mean? To bring in desks and lights? No, there were no desks and lights. There was well, just a room. You, but I don't know. See, this is exactly what's driving me crazy about this. What do you mean, reset up? Restore lease a, lease would space. mean. I'm lease going, the space. No, no. The board order means they've got to go release space. Yes, the, it's, oh, they well, are well, supposed then. to set, they are supposed to re open RAV as it existed on the date of the unfair labor practice, May 14th. And that, that includes, I've got to go now lease some spaces that I'm about to tell you I'm not going to use because I don't want to be in business anymore. That's why I'm not understanding the Gissel and Restoration. That can't be what the board's order is. I have to go lease space, even though as a matter of law, I can tell you one day after, I don't want to be in business and that's lawful. But I have to go lease space your Honor, that is that is what the restoration order that this court has enforced in no, no, other no. cases I think, does. I think you'd have to send me, if you want to do after argument submission, to show me that that's what was happening in a situation where the employer did not want to remain in business. I, and, so the, I don't know, Your Honor, about not wanting to remain in business. Well, that's what I'm talking about. There's we f we don't know if that's the case here, and I that's I don't know that in other cases the board can the board considers as a factor the employer's I interest in remaining in business. What the board looks at is whether they f f close the business with anti-union animus in order to chill. Uh, the um, uh, other employees at another entity from engaging in Section Seven protected conduct. Yeah. If after the if after the board's ruling, as enforced by this court, the the employer decides that it doesn't want to keep um, to stay in business, that wouldn't be part of the record within uh, you know as decided by the by the board. That can happen after the fact. Right. So I don't know that I can find you a case in which the employer says. But I don't want to start over. Don't make me start over. I really don't want to do it. What I can find you is a case that says you have to reopen the, your business as it existed at the time. In fact, that's what the what the what the order in this case says. All right. Okay. I have my answers from you. I have answers from both of you in this very strange case. All right, Judge Tatum. I just have a, a yeah. I just have one one question. I, I want to try to get at this. Uh, at, at what Judge Edwards is asking you in a slightly different way. So the ALJ said that the findings regarding uh, or the violation regarding the closing of the business and the uh, firing of uh, Gonzalez were, he called them alternative remedies, right? I mean, alternative findings. And you, the board repeats that in. Oh, uh, with, with regard, I'm sorry, with regard to Gonzalez specifically? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Gonzalez and the closing, they're alternative. So yeah. when I see that in a brief, what I think is, okay, our court, we need to decide, we don't have to decide both of those. We can, we can deny the petition. If one of them, if we find, for example, that the Gonzalez uh, firing, that the, that, the, that the finding that Gonzalez was fired for union activities, is supported by substantial evidence, then we can we can deny the petition. We don't have to go on and decide, address the uh, the other violation of closing. Is that correct? Uh, no, Your Honor. If I understand your question, the, it's the not? where where the where the board ex where the board said that about them being alternative findings was yeah. only specifically with regards to Gonzalez's termination. And if you'll let me explain, the board yeah, made please. the board made one finding that under Darlington, the company unlawfully closed REV for the reasons that I was discussing. Could, I'm sorry, could you, I, you just broke up at, at a slight oh, sorry. internet problem here. Could you start? Sure. After you said, let me explain. Sure. <laughs> okay, go ahead. That's a good, that's a good place to start. Um, yeah. So the board made one finding, which was the, the one I was discussing with Judge Edwards, that the company violated the act 
by closing RAV with the intent of chilling union activity at Concrete Express. That's one finding. The board also made a finding that Gonzalez was unlawfully discharged. And what the board said is that there are two ways to find that Gonzalez was unlawfully discharged. One is because we found that RAV was unlawfully closed, it follows that Gonzalez's discharge as a result of the unlawful closure is unlawful itself. Alternatively, we can find, say the Court of Appeals finds that RAV was not unlawfully closed, we can still find under right line that Gonzalez was unlawfully fired for, anti, uh, for engaging in union activity. Does that make sense? Um, so you're saying that we do have to decide both issues, right? <laughs> yes, in short, uh, that's what I'm saying. But 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 uh, but I'd like I'd like to be sure. I'd like to be sure. Where would I clear. where would I find that explanation? I mean, okay, I get what you're saying. Did I miss something in the briefs? Did um, was that in the briefs? Perhaps perhaps the briefs were were ill. Um, were not written as artfully as they should have been. The, the, the place in the decision where I would, um, mm -hmm. that where I would direct you is um, on page 11, the, it says REV closure and discharge of Victor Gonzalez. It, and that is where the, 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 that's where the judge says on one hand, I can find, I found already that, a, um, or no, he's going to find later on. But I, on, the, on one hand, I can find that Gonzalez was fired strictly for engaging in union activity under right line. But I can also find that he was fired unlawfully as collateral damage, if you will, from the unlawful closure of REV. So that, that is at page 11 in, okay. the, in the board's decision. And... I'm, yeah. I'm happy if you want to no, all right, that's, come no, back to me you, after, I, Mr. I'm sorry. No, you've, you've, that's enough. Thank you. I, I get your point. I, get, I take your point. Sure. One, Thank you. Karen, one, uh, Judge Henderson, one last question. Do you, suppose the record shows, the, uh, as, as we proceed forward, uh, it now shows, I don't care what it did show in the hearing before the board, that this operation doesn't exist as a business entity and any longer. It doesn't, it doesn't, have, it doesn't, have, the, doesn't have the required license. Uh, it doesn't have the lease space. Uh, it's not authorized by the state to do whatever it is they used to do. Are what you mean? saying today or at a compliance hearing? Today meaning post a board hearing, you know, okay. now okay. compliance. I mean, it can get to a compliance, but let's assume that's the situation. Mm -hmm. They don't have a license to do this work anymore. They don't have a lease space anymore. Uh, they have a Gissel bargaining order. That's understandable. And you can bargain over effects. That would make sense to me. You can, the effects mm -hmm. of the closing. But in terms of restoration, what are you talking about? They say, I, we don't have a license. You mean we well, the license? The license is, is, is building specific. It's not, it doesn't go with the business. At Edison, at Edison, the building had a license. But to... in the state, you have to have a license to do the kind of work you're doing, no matter where the lease space is. No, you need you, the the lease. Th that is not my understanding. My understanding well, is I'll that the space has that to have seems, registration. That seems really strange to me that you can be in a business to do something merely because you have a building and claim to be doing something, but you don't otherwise have a license to do what it is you want to do. That makes no sense. That was my understanding from reading, well, frankly, we'll their, the company's pleading. Well, let me ask counsel about that, because that sure makes no sense. I can do whatever I want as long as I have a building? I don't think so. That can't be. And it, so assume I'm right. My okay. instinct yep. is right. Mm -hmm. They don't have a license if it's required, and, and maybe it's not required. Sure. They don't have a license. They don't have a lease. And forget what they prefer to do, but that's the way they stand. And now what? They got a Gissel bargaining order. So yeah, maybe they have to bargain about something. But now what's your argument with respect to restoration? I want to make sure I understand this. 
No, I understand. My argument, Your Honor, is that unless it poses an undue burden, meaning that they cannot afford to do it, or if it would endanger the health of the remaining business, they must find, they must lease a new building with and the proper registration, and they must rehire the two employees that they and they fired. must go get they must must go get the necessary license. Exactly. They've got to recreate themselves. Mm -hmm. Not themselves. Yeah. Just, the, just, the just the one part of their business that the they put. They've got to recreate a business entity. Right. All right. And now is there some case law, and I'm, I'm happy to look at it, that says we'll, you have to recreate a business entity that does not really exist on the date when you'll now be required to do it. I'm not talking about, can you find cases where the, comp the board said to the company, you have to get this operation up to speed again. I'm talking about a situation where not only the building's gone, the lease is gone, the license is gone, and the board has said, notwithstanding all of that, you have to recreate it, go find a lease, go find a license, and make yourself a real operation again and then, oh, incidentally, as you and I have just spent a half an hour talking about, incidentally, then you have the right to bargain and say, we're not going to stay like this. So you'll cancel all of what you just did in one day. Wait, show me the case. Okay. I will, I, will, uh, I will file something with the court, uh, I hope, by the end of today, if not tomorrow. Now, don't give me the ones you've been giving me. I understand all of that. <laughs> I want one that, that they're not I, news to me. I want I will, one where, they, where it's not there anymore and the board says, no, no, go create it. Very good. Okay. All right. Judge Edwards, are you finished? I am, Judge Henderson. Right. Thank you. Judge Tatel, are you finished? Yes. All right. Um, Mr. Tulinchit will give you two minutes in response. Can you answer the question first, just so I have this information before I forget? Yes. Uh, uh, does any of this, is there a license that's required? My understanding is... RAV was registered as a repair shop. So registered, my understanding is registered would be quote unquote a license. Okay. But in order to be registered, in order to participate in that business, the building that you're in has to have certain requirements um, under New York law as to what is required in order to perform repairs on, on trucks, cars, and again, it, some automatic sprinklers, some fire alarms, some standpipes, oil and water separators, so that when you know things go in the drain, you're not getting oil and grease that are going in the in the city's sewer system. Right. So that that is my understanding of the motor vehicle repair shop. So when I'm registered, yes, that is my license. But you also have to have an actual building that meets all of the specifications. Okay. And then just one point I wanted to bring up, it's not enough under Darlington to show that closing Rob would have the foreseeable consequence of possible union chilling at the other location. They, the, the general counsel has to show that the motivation behind closing Rob was to chill unionism at Concrete Express. When he closed Rob, Concrete Express had already had its election. All, all the quote unquote unfair labor practices that he mentioned had already happened at Concrete Express. If he wanted to chill unionism at Concrete Express, he could have closed down Rav right before the election and he did not. No, that argument is not a winning argument because there's so many cases that will show you that you can have the chilling effect. It doesn't matter when you're saying to these related employees, if you push us in collective bargaining or anything else, we'll close you down too. That's what the board cases say. We'll take, we'll take you out. That's our threat. So, and, and we'll do it at any time. We're so angry about this. Uh, and if you keep pushing us in collective bargaining and you keep pushing us with a union, we'll close you. That's all they need. I'm, I'm more I'm more troubled to try and understand what this restoration means. Uh, but OK, I don't have anything more, Judge Henderson. Thank you for the time. All right. Counsel, counsel for, all right. Counsel, are you finished? 
with your re reply. Yes, Your Honor. All right. Well, then let's do this. Mr. Sauter, you have until noon tomorrow to file what you want to file as far as authority. And Mr. Tulinsick, you have until noon on Friday to file anything in reply. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. And Mr. Sauter, I would, I would respectfully request, please don't give me the cases that you know I understand. I'm giving you a precise kind of scenario of a reconstruction where it doesn't exist. And, and, when, and everyone understands with a Gissel bargaining order in hand, that employer, that employer still can be made to bargain about effects. And you, you're telling me, I want to see a case where the board says, notwithstanding, they got the Gissel bargaining order, they still can be forced to bargain about uh, effects, but we're going to make them recreate themselves, get the license, go get a lease, get a building, even though the next day we all agree they can walk out. All right. Anything further? Oh. Madam Clerk, right. would you yes, give us an adjournment? Thank you. This honorable court is now adjourned until Monday, February 22nd at 9.30 a.m.